Welcome to the Global from Asia podcast, where the daunting process of running an international business from Hong Kong is broken down into straight up actionable advice. And now your host, Michael Michelini. Welcome everybody to magic number 99, Global from Asia. The summer is coming to an end and back to school season and back to work season is coming for a lot of us. Luckily, I have a couple more years before I have to pay the bills for my kid to go to school, but it's good motivation for me to keep on pushing. Also, a pretty big announcement. Uh, uh, Wendy and I are having our second kid on the way through the end of January, around Chinese New Year time frame. So uh, I'm putting a post up on my personal blog at mikesblog.com and link it up on the show notes if you're interested to read all the details about that. Also, next week, I'm going to launch Global from Asia TV. It's a video podcast. Uh, just when I got over being shy, putting my voice online out there on this show, I'm going to try to take it up another notch and do some videos. I'm going to talk about business, similar type of topics here. It's right now just my head talking um, about different topics that people have been asking me on the blog and things. And I have a few pre-recorded, and I'm going to start to release them every other Tuesday. Uh, so one week will be this audio podcast you listen to, and then the other week will be the video show. So I'd love to hear your feedback and get a laugh at my first few uh, shows as I get more comfortable with it. Okay, enough of announcements. Let's get into the meat of today's show. We have my friend Andy Church with us. He's a huge source of knowledge about quality control in China. He gives us some overview of the processes and terms you should be aware of. Some things that I even learned and heard about the first time today. So definitely take your notebooks out and here we go. Okay, so thank you everybody for tuning in to another Global From Asia podcast. We have with us an uh, old friend of mine. We've known each other many years, Andy Church from Insight Quality Services. So thanks for uh, coming on the show and, and sharing yeah, sure, Mike. Thanks for asking me to uh, share some of my experience and what my business does and uh, how we help companies both in China and import product from China. I started Insight Quality Services about a year and a half ago after living in Shenzhen for over 12 years and working for third-party quality assurance firms that uh, uh, had originally moved me to Asia, to China, and uh, decided that it was a good time to uh, repatriate back to the States uh, primarily so I could spend some time with my folks and looking at what I could do with the skill sets that I had gleaned in China um, really led me you know, to focus on the same area that uh, I had grown to know very well. And so I started my own business and decided to locate in the center of the country in the U.S., so it made it very easy to meet with customers on either coast or in the central and also a gateway city to Asia. Um, Insight is a third-party quality assurance and sourcing agency. We started off strictly offering inspections and factory audits. There's a lot of other mainland Chinese companies that do the same thing, and some owned and managed by Westerners, some not, but they're seemed to be a void in a Western-owned business that was based in the U.S. that had Western management in China. And uh, that is where I decided our niche was going to be. It was focusing on those customers who needed a lot more, if not the same time zone, very similar time zones to where they were based. And they wanted somebody that they could call during their office hours. And since that time, we have morphed into or evolved into offering a lot more sourcing services for smaller importers that uh, of any size, but I've really focused our niche on on companies that are uh, between five and ten million in FOB that don't have their own presence in China or are managing via a freelance uh, person that's based in the in the mainland or and or by lots of trips to Asia, which is not necessarily the most conducive or productive way to manage. Uh, a supply base, uh, and certainly not to proactively work with factories, and oftentimes those trips put out fires. So our business has become one that uh, is stretching a little bit of where I what I knew about sourcing because my business previously we were always devolved peripherally but never directly in the sourcing aspects, meaning you know buying and selling and dealing directly with the factories on 
uh, you know, contract terms and that type of thing. Uh, we were focused solely before on production timing and quality aspects and functionality and those types. So there was certainly a lot of crossover. So there's been a, a little bit of a learning curve in the last year, but certainly one that has been, <clears throat> excuse me, fun and has been uh, of a great benefit to our customers. Uh, we've grown tremendously in the last 18 months, and um, uh, right now we have 12 employees in China, and we have six part-time employees in the States. We're also doing some work in the U.S., which I had not planned when we started. So that's Interesting. fun as well. Yeah, and I, I can agree. I can, I can uh, understand the demand for sourcing. A lot of people... Of course, they all know they can price search online and chat on online to factories, but uh, I think I think people want somebody that they they know and can trust. So so uh, that's great. I'm happy for you. And so a little bit more. How on the China side? You said your your previous project or, or employer sent you out here. How maybe a lot of people always like to hear the China story. How how did you first get in get into China? Yeah, it was back in um, 2002. Well, I actually let me back up. Two years prior, I had returned to school to finish my undergraduate degree, which, as many Americans listeners can relate, that uh, we often have a lot of non-traditional students or people who don't finish for a variety of reasons and go back later in life. And I, that's what I had done. I went back to school in my late 20s to finish my undergraduate uh, bachelor's degree. And during that time, about six months before I graduated. I was on an accelerated plan in about a 18, 24 months. You know, you want to do it as fast as you can when you go back and you're interrupting your career. But <clears throat> I had the opportunity to travel to Asia with a university delegation. And our first country uh, was China. And we went on to visit uh, uh, Thailand, South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. And China was our first country. And it was my first time to Asia. I had traveled like many Americans, to the Caribbean and Canada and Mexico, but never really been out of my comfort zone. And I was just enamored by the energy back then. And <clears throat> we can imagine how it – I mean, even now people talk about visiting China and the energy and the excitement and, and uh, the capitalistic behaviors they hadn't expected. Well, I saw all those things way back then, and I just decided when I graduated in six months, uh, I was graduating in December of – 2002, that I was going to find a job in China. And I made that comedy, comment to somebody shortly after the return of my uh, trip with this delegation. It was uh, seven weeks. And a week later, I had a, uh, an interview with a Connecticut-based company. A few months later, they sent me out for a pre-move exploratory trip after they made me a job offer to ensure that you know, we were on the same page. When I saw that <laughs> office, I began to question whether or not – <laughs> we were going to be on the same page. Back in uh, Shenzhen in 2002, there was no no, no Coco Park. There was uh, really – Futian was still largely fam- farmland. There was the Wuzhou Guest House and not much else there. The China Merchants Tower had just been finished construction. Macaulay's and SeaWorld wasn't open yet. There wasn't a whole lot. Uh, you know, There was a few bars down town Shenzhen and places for other expats to congregate. But nonetheless, I moved in January of 20, uh, 2003 and on a two-year assignment. And like many expats, that excitement, that ex- assignment morphed into many more years because I just loved the, the culture. I loved the, uh, how my personal and professional capabilities and comfort zones were being expanded and tested. And um, man, it was just an amazing experience to see Shenzhen, not only see Shenzhen grow from around roughly 5 million. I mean, the numbers always are not very clear sometimes, but Shenzhen about 2003 was about 5 million. And when I moved and relocated back to the U.S. uh, this time last year in 2014, it's somewhere 15, 16, 17 million. So, you know, the city tripled in those years. There was no subway line. I saw the first line from Lohu to Windows of the World open and now – you know, I don't yeah, know, 200 stops <laughs> or I, I, an amazing a network of subway stops and, and, and transportation. I saw how the Chinese workforce evolved, how the one-child policy affected workers. I mean, it, when I moved to China, there 
just the be- very beginning of the college grads or maybe the first workers working in factories that were the result of the uh, population control policies that China had in place. So how those changes evolved in the workplace and affected teamwork and uh, you know whatnot. So there's a lot of social policies and things that I didn't appreciate when I was in school in anthropology class. I was going, I'm living that now and uh, recognizing that the world certainly does not revolve around any one country, that it is a, a, a true network and re- so many economies and manufacturing and businesses are so interrelated and global. And that experience, those time in China and my continued time and going back to China have just been phenomenal. And uh, me not only gaining that only understanding for myself, but sharing it with my friends, family and business associates. Yeah, I mean, I remember we, we you were one of the first people I met. I think it was like, uh, I think Monday Night Football at, at Mike Bellamy's place or something in 2007, yeah. I remember. And that was 07. And so you had already, yeah, I remember you'd give me a lot of tips. And, and I remember going to see SeaWorld uh, and the hash and things too. So it was really great to, to, to bump, luckily to bump into you then. So the one I just want, want to say one thing. So looking about that, we drove 30 minutes away to go watch American football those years ago because back then it was very difficult to stream, you know, or get replay of Western sports. Yeah. And that, that's a great segue into dealing business with China. The way things were done then is certainly not the way they are now. So that's true. That's true. So, so yeah, it was, I, I hope, I think people appreciate that those, those stories and la it's just, yeah, I mean, a lot of people haven't still been to China, and it's it's just always evolving, right? Um, that's for sure. So you can't – what it is now might not be what it is in two or three, four years from now. So today we're going to talk about QC and quality control between China and I mean, in Western markets. We're going to give a couple of tips between, for distributors and manufacturers. I have some items here. So maybe first, before, I want to back up before I go right into it. Maybe define the difference. Can you help me uh, understand the difference between a distributor and a manufacturer? I mean, I think there's a basic idea people have, but is, is there for them to know if they're, which one they are? So I think that that's an excellent question and one that even – Within the same industry, uh, there are there's confusion on what is a manufacturer, a factory, a supplier, manufacturer, distributor. You know, there, there's a lot of different terms for the same functions. So, I generally look at the manufacturer as the entity that is producing the product, uh, the production where the production line is located. So, depending on who you're talking to, that could be the manufacturer, could be the factory, or the supplier. Or some other term. Got it. Got it. So would that be a brand owner that has a design? Is Apple a manufacturer or is Apple a – Well, I mean there's certainly an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer, but you know they contract manufacturer, meaning they source out the production of their products to factories. So I mean I think this is where they're, you know, they're, it can be confusing because I, I think in some classification Apple is a manufacturer – but they don't uh, i don't believe that they own any of their own factories they contract the manufacturing of their products to many to other manufacturers or factories so you know if uh, at the same time they're a retailer uh, which you know there there are a fair number of those but they're not as prevalent as say a the big box retail store that is not a man they also could be a manufacturer because they have their own private brand products uh, but then they buy those through a, a vendor or an importer or – you know. so the terminology, it, it can be confusing. So it's important I think to, to talk about the function. Got it. So I think probably most listeners are distributor, finding a yeah. manufacturer mostly. If you're, if you're probably in the West, like Western markets like in, in the US or – or uh, Europe, you're probably a distributor finding an ch- a Asian manufacturer and then just selling these goods into your home market. Right, and I think that maybe probably many of your listeners are maybe wholesalers as well and would certainly fall under the classification in their home country as an importer. 
So, you know, the, a distributor generally in the U.S. I was just attended a National Chamber of Commerce of conference, business conference last week, and there were many distributors of promotional products and very few wholesalers. All the distributors bought from a wholesaler in the U.S., and only the wholesaler was a, it was an importer from product from China. None of the distributors. Uh, that I met last week imported products. So, you know, when you, you get down, you can delve into the, the, the terminology and whatnot. But I, I think a distributor is somebody who's buying and selling product. And so certainly many of your listeners would fall into that category um, in a different industry classifications or product classifications that that structure of uh, between the factory who is importing the product, whether they're a wholesaler and then selling to a distributor, and then the end consumer, you know, it fluctuates. But the, the, I think that we want to focus on probably the companies who are buying product from China and importing it to their home country, and they could be, you know, one of those different terms. All of them, none, you know, maybe something else altogether. Got it. Yeah, I mean. I, I guess just the whole like every like everything is changing, which keeps the world interesting. But the supply chain terms are really overlapping, right? Like like uh, it's yeah. It's, I mean, absolutely. I could share a little bit if you'd like me to about you know I have customers that fit each one of those, um, and they and how we help them, and it gets into you know maybe some questions about uh, that you may have been wanting to ask. But, sure, sure. You know, um, I. My first customer that I started with from day one started off in the U.S., their fourth generation, which is not that common for any business, but in the U.S., and they're based in Texas, and they started off as a flooring wholesaler. So they bought product from somebody else and sold it to retail stores who sold it to the end con- consumer. They have evolved into pro- – they, they manufacture their own private brand. And so they, I, depending on the definition, they could be considered a manufacturer because they're contract manufacturing their own brand to factories in China of a wood flooring, uh, vinyl, luxury vinyl tile, all different types of flooring that you would uh, you know, put in a, in a home, a remodel, new home, construction home. Um, so they run the gamut. So they, don't, they do everything but retail. They're a wholesaler. They're a you know the NM importer. They're a, a manufacturer and they're a distributor. So they kind of use all those terms, and they have evolved into dealing with their factories. They have a very small team in China, so we help them with supplementing their existing team with quality services. Another one of my customers, they are most of their customers call them an importer. They sell to retailers in the U.S. The department store retailers in some strip mall. Uh, women's retail s- stores that sell clothing, fashion accessories, and jewelry. And this customer is a, a, a private brand jewelry importer. And private brand means they sell the brand's, the store's brand. So, you know, they sell Mike's luxury jewelry. Uh, and, you know, you sell it to the re- – and then you would go on and sell it to the retailer. So <clears throat> we help them. They already had a factory base. They import directly from China, so they buy from the factory. There's one middle point in the retail, and we help them with sourcing quality services and service their office and team in China. And then I have a third customer who is in electronics and based in Miami, Florida, and they predominantly do mobile phones throughout the world, and they have some government contracts to provide phones to those that are less fortunate than us, and they sell to other distributors and other brands so they don't make their own brand they sell other brands many other brands and there also would be you know similar to the jewelry importer a private brand contract manufacturer and they also don't have any presence in china and we serve all their sourcing and quality needs so you know the three very different industries and the terms are very different, but they all have one thing in common. They're buying product in China and they're selling to somebody else. Got it. Sure. So I think that definitely covers, I know, a lot of listeners I've talked to. And so I think they are probably smaller. I don't know if they would be your typical client, but, you know, they're, they're, let me, they're probably searching online, but maybe give them some tips for finding a factory or, or supplier in, in China. I know that's a huge question that could be a book, but, uh, um, so it is, and there's many different tacks and there's going to be, 
for every two people you or every person you add to the conversation, there's going to be at least one more opinion and their thoughts. So the only thing I can do is share with you and your listeners of what I know and what I've experienced and some of the pros and cons of going different using different methods to find suppliers. I'll only add I'd be willing to talk to anybody I and mean, a little later I can share, you know, how to reach us or something. But it the most important thing when you're dealing with any uh, service provider and factory is communication. Uh, you know, if at the very beginning there are communication issues, then that is only going to be exacerbated as the process continues. So, you know, there, there's red flags. And just think of, you know, personal relationships and friendships or girlfriends, spouses. You know, when you, when you start a relationship with somebody and there's a red flag, meaning something just you know, should have warned you or, uh, it, I mean, think a red card, you know, in a football, soccer game, you know, if you're red card, it's a warning and a red flag is simply that it's a warning of something. It's hard to communicate with somebody. It's not clear. You can't get what you feel is a, should be a straight answer to a simple question. Then, you know, you, you can, you got to try a different way, but if it just doesn't feel right, then, you know, maybe it's time to move on to, to another potential supplier, factory, or service provider. So communication, communication is vital. And so I think that it sometimes gets overlooked because, oh, we need to make it work. We'll figure it out as we go. And that becomes very difficult because as you go, things become more technical. Timelines become more critical. So I think that's the first thing. No matter where you find somebody, whether it's a you know the multitude of sites, Alibaba, or you know some of these other made in China or made in you know wherever dot coms, and they have a list of factories. If you can't communicate, walk away. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a fair one. Um, and then hopefully they don't mind staying up late at night and chatting on Skype if they're dealing direct with a factory. But, uh, but yeah. That's that's always a challenge. And I will say my communication comment is not just about the language. I mean you can speak the same native language, English or French or you know I started to say British, but that's English as well. <laughs> but uh you know, there's their own nuances even within the English language. But you can speak the same language and not feel not gel, connect whatever, feel like you're getting the straight answers with somebody. So it's not just that it's in English to a Chinese or Chinese to English. It's, you know, the same culture or whatever, whoever you're working with, you have to be able to communicate. So, and then beyond that, how you find somebody, they, the communication timing, uh, you mentioned the, the, the hours, the time zone differences. You know, I like where we're based in the U.S. because I look at it as being one hour difference. I mean, it's right now we're 13 hours behind China. So it's ideal for me uh, it, it, being a morning person. You know, I get up uh, early. I can communicate with uh, our Chinese team and factories and suppliers before they end their day. Before I head off to, to sleep in the evening, they are have started their day in a few days into their a few hours into their day. So for me, this is an ideal. The U.S. Eastern and Central time zones are ideal for doing business with China. You know, and some other people, other cultures and time zones feel the same they like the six hour and or seven hours in europe so timing if you and this it's tied into an element of communication if you don't get timely responses you're going to have a struggle meeting your requirements to you know commitments to to the to whoever the distributor importer customer is because everybody's always waiting on information so it's critical that be able to communicate and that that communication is timely True, but I, sometimes maybe it's easy. The communication when things are easy, like uh, maybe we we'll go back to dating, right? Like when when things are going well, communication is easy. But when things get tough, I think that's when you really find out about your relationship, right? So it, sometimes it's hard to fast forward uh, fast forward to a difficulty in a in a in a relationship with a factory because I think at the beginning they're really fast usually. But when it gets complicated or there's some problems is when I think I've noticed some communication breakdown. So I'll just give a couple other points on what somebody – what I believe somebody should look for when they are trying to find a factory or find how to buy something is it's very important that the buyer 
understand what their needs are. Do you simply want to buy something that needs no customization? It's a widget. It's a you know uh, a coaster, just a, a ceramic coaster with a logo, nothing else. Or you know you, you don't need size customizations. Be very clear on what your needs are. And in in, when somebody starts out, they may not know what their needs are, and those may evolve. And so, be willing to understand that what you think you need may end up being very different than what you actually need. But you have to start somewhere. And is it, do you just want to buy something off the shelf? Imagine going in to a retail store and just buying a, a shirt or suit off the shelf. And you don't want it any customized. You'll wear it any, as long as it fits, you know, somewhat okay. Then, you know, you can buckle the, the pants and uh, it's fine. Or do you need it so, you know, you like, uh, you know, tailored, bespoke? Do you, you know, so those are two very different things. They're both suits in the end. But they're very different methods and going about it. So oftentimes we deal with customers who don't understand what they need. I need I need help buying this. Well, they want to buy it, but then they end up wanting to make you know a lot of changes. Where at the very beginning it would have been a much cleaner process. Had you know I want to buy something like this, but I, I want to you know maybe different color, a different size, different texture. And I'm not sure how to go about it because you know you could be looking at the same, looking at an item, and then talk about changing the texture, the 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 some of the the raw materials that make up the bulk of that product. Well, then you could be looking at a whole different factory mix. True. So true. It, that it, understanding what and as I mentioned, they evolve or can potentially evolve is understanding needs. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I think uh, having a I think a lot of people. T- don't even know what a specification is, but maybe a list, a list of what they want. Not not like needing to see stuff. A lot of times, people need to see a sample first, and then they get ideas. But of course, if you're, the more you know up front about your product and 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 what you need is is the best the best thing. So, let's let's go to the next section is uh which is your specialty QC or quality control again like a huge huge topic here that uh, is you know is your expertise but um what are some prevent but maybe some ways to prevent like issues from from coming up with with QC so i i will go back to the word you just mentioned specification some may not know what it is you could say a checklist if and these are all these steps are intertwined and at the very beginning, somebody who doesn't have a sample or any anything that's tangible to work with a factory, some you know, there's pros and cons to that. But they just have an idea, and then they make the idea. They you know, you, through discussion of what they want, and then the factory ends up making it, and what comes out is nowhere near what they had envisioned. It's important that a checklist or specification be created that document the different components of that widget or, you know, to use, you know, a suit again or a coffee mug or something. There's so many different variables to things that can seem so simple. So it's vital that as part of the QC process and even before the QC process, I would add, when you're placing that order with the factory that you have a specification. And the things that specification should include would be material and components. What is the bol- what is the product made of? Uh, I'll choose something simple, a, cer- a coffee mug. Is it ceramic, plastic? You know, is, <laughs> what is it made of? Very different things. Uh, what are the colors? What are the finish? Does it have logos? Does it, if it has a logo in different colors, are are they is it just blue is it royal blue is it a pantone color the more detail you that can be provided the less opportunity for product being shipped there is that it will not meet that it, the more detailed the more the better the chance that what you receive is what you want so you know size weight measurements there's much detail that can be provided of what the product should be and look like the better. True. Yeah, I think uh, I think sometimes maybe especially entrepreneurs or or you know idea guys don't have the best uh, best detail skills. But I think when it gets down to manufacturing and, and being successful, I think you have a very 
attention to detail, especially in quality control. So another another point I want to bring up, and I think it's important, is sometimes, at least for me, when I was I was doing it a, a while ago for some of my products, was I thought it had to be like a s- secret with the factory about my checklist or what I was going to check with my quality control. But I've learned that that's not the case, right? You want to work with your factory. It's not like you're trying to surprise them or hide something or 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 what what's your what's your thinking on that absolutely i mean we can all sign ndas with one another all day long with factories with sharing information with a company like mine trying to help an importer or somebody trying to source At the end of the day if you don't have trust with one another a contract isn't gonna you know keep anybody from sharing something with anybody else so contracts are important they have a place but you have to be able to share information with your factory. You have to give them these the specifications I just talked about, be able to communicate freely because if you don't, then it's just going to be a very awkward and, and you know, combative maybe a little bit of a strong – too strong of a word. But it, it's just not going to be a free-flowing relationship. So – you have to be able to share detailed specifications with your factory. Depending on the product, we're not in the industry, and I'll pitch one of your other uh, podcast uh, uh, speakers and one of our uh, mutual friends. Mike Bellamy at Passage Maker offers black box, what he calls black box manufacturing uh, services. So depending on the item, if you don't want the factory to know, you know potentially end customer or what the – product is, is is paired together with something else. And there's companies out there who offer the services where they can do final packaging or they compare two items together into a set that make a component that maybe you know somebody else wouldn't have thought of. So there are methods to minimize the opportunity for uh, intellectual property or you know IP theft or or uh, you know being abused. So I mean, you just got to have that communication with the factory, and there are ways to minimize, but you have to be able to willing to share the checklist with your factory. I mean, I believe that it should be incorporated as part of a purchase order in your contract, and all the way through the inspection process, because the factory needs to know what you're inspecting to. Hopefully, you're doing inspections, but whatever your quality process is, the factory needs to know because they should be doing those same things in their own internal quality checks. And if you come in as a buyer of a the the product that the factory is producing and inspect as something completely different, then that is just not that's not good. I mean, it, it it's uh, uh, there's going to be problems. Exactly. So yeah, I think that's the key is just to be able to not be afraid to share the, with the factory what you're going to be checking and and what you're what you think is important and and uh, and treating them like a partner. If you know, and and as long as you tr- of course if you trust them, but if you don't trust them, you probably shouldn't be working with them, right? So. Right. And, and, you know, Mike, I want to say about trust. It, there's so many people that, it, that say, don't trust somebody from this country. Don't some, f- within that country, you can't trust somebody from that state, that province. Oh, you know, they're just, they're all crooks. You know, the reality is there's people out there who bend the rules and, you know, maybe are crooks or take advantage of a situation of a customer. And there's people who don't in every culture, everywhere. And I think that you just have to, Oftentimes, and not always, but it's one of the tools, is the red flags, the gut feelings, the lack of communication, lack of timely responses. All those things go to building trust. And, uh, you know, it's very, I find it very important that, you know, I, I listen to my instincts. And if a factory isn't willing to share with you what their internal checklist is, because you, as the buyer, want not sure where to start with a quality checklist or specification and you ask the factory for guidance and they're not willing to share something, you know, that should be that should be a big raise a big question mark. So it's a two way street. The buyer shouldn't always be providing what the specifications are because they may not know. You know, so you know, there are those uh, things that, you know, sometimes are customer specific that a factory may not want to share. It's okay to ask, and it's okay for the factory to say, "I can't share that." That is, you know, customer specific. Blah blah blah. You should be you should be happy that they say that, because that shows you that they value uh, the relationship and maybe the secrecy, uh, the whatever their agreement is with that factory. They value that. If a factory continually says, "Oh well, such and such does this, such and such does that," I don't know. Are they going to be too free with what you do with them? You know, those are. 
like I said, pros and cons. Sometimes you, you just got to weigh uh, where to start. So you know, it's just vital that – uh, it, uh, it's not just the supply, the buyer who is the one giving information or sharing. It's a two-way street. True, true. So um, for QC, when the production is started, sh- should they be checking on production lines or should they do it right. after it's finished? Should they do like a, f- a spot check, a certain percentage check, a 100% check? I, I know this is some questions people ask and I guess I feel like I know there's always these it depends on the situation, but mm, <laughs> it depends, but, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, there's always when, when should uh, quality be incorporated into the production process, I think is a good way to ask that question. And I would say certainly it depends, but I'd also start by saying that quality begins with the buy. I'll go back again. The specifications, quality needs to be incorporated from day one when the discussions with the factory, what the expectation is, because you can inspect during or after production is complete. And if it wasn't agreed upon what the quality checks would entail with the what agreed upon with the factory, you're, there's going to be lots of issues. So quality uh, really needs to begin at the very beginning in discussions with the manufacturer, the factory, and then incorporated through the checklist, the specifications, a uh, checklist. There's different types of inspections, and those are top, which is top of production, uh, pre-production, which is raw material, in, incoming raw materials, checking those, top of production, in line, and then final inspections. So there's three or four different type of inspection um, times. They all have a different purpose. I would say uh, to, to sum it up, the higher the risk, the more inspections you want. So you, know, you have a very new item that entails a lot of components and is an exp- and is expensive. You know, I mean, the higher the the price of the item, the more important that inspections become uh, from a risk standpoint. So the more components, and depending on what the components are, a raw material inspection may be in order. Making sure that the fa- and those you may use the factory to do those and ask them to provide things. But depending on what it is, some asking the factory that they should test for heavy metals or maybe phthalates before they go into production on certain raw materials. With Chinese labs, uh, very quick turnaround times, very good pricing these days on on heavy metal testing. So certain things you, you could rely on the factory to do and then ask for documentation or as the buyer uh, conduct on your own. The top pre-production, top of production and then line inspections, a lot of that – Depends on the, the the production cycle, the production timing. If a production, the order quantity and the and the factory's capability, capacity to produce that order uh, is going to have them finish order in one or two days or less than a week, then it's very uh, unlikely that an inline inspection or during production inspection is going to bring much value, unless at the same time that that inspector can immediately work with the factory to address any nonconformances found. So taking in the, you know, what the production cycle is uh, in the item uh, and the ability to make changes during that process uh, would be idea, components to, to keep in mind when determining whether or not an inline inspection takes place. A final inspection, also called a pre-shipment inspection, final random or pre-shipment inspection, also FRI, PSI, lots of initials, but uh, is simply when the product is 100% produced and generally at least 80% packed and is to ensure that before the product ships, it meets the criteria that was set out and agreed upon with the factory. So that's the most common. That's the shipment that – or that's the inspection rather that retailers and buyers have been doing for many, many years and the more repetitive your order – the less risk you have potentially. So, you know, oftentimes if you're reordering the same item over and over monthly, quarterly, uh, you know, you, maybe you go to every other inspection or a risk-based inspection program. But the final random inspection is the most common. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the most critical, but it is critical to ensure that it's done, you know, especially first-time orders. Um, so all those different type inspection types really de- it depends <laughs> on um, uh, on what your product is, the risk of your product, and in the same product by different buyers may have different risk. 
if you're buying something for the very first time, even though it may be a non-technical item, back to the coffee mug, it's a large order, potential new customer, uh, you, you want to make sure it's done from the very right from the very beginning. So in that case, uh, uh, an inline inspection may be – you may find it critical where somebody else who is buying buying coffee mugs over and over every month from the same factory, they've evolved and they only do shipments on every third or fourth purchase order. Got it. No, that's a really great answer, Andy, and this has been a, been a great interview and I respect your time and we've had a really, really good chat today and I'm sure listeners – got a lot about it so you already offered people to reach out to you with you and your business maybe now is a good time to share ways people can check out what you do and and how to how to contact you for more information sure and i'll, I'll just leave before i do that i'll just leave with a few things that i think are really important communication checklist specifications mistakes issues are going to happen don't panic i mean just get the facts straight and communicate and to me, most importantly, uh, with all those things, is enjoy what you're doing and have fun doing it. You know, this is so be happy to talk to anybody, share, you know, our experiences more in depth. Or if somebody has questions uh, about anything that we talked about, um, you can do that via my email, which is Andy, A N D Y dot church, C H U R C H, at insight, I N S I G H T dash quality. Q U A L I T Y dot com. And our website is insight, I N S I G H T dash quality dot com. And those are, and there's also a, a contact us uh, link. And we have some, uh, you know, been blogging uh, since the inception of our business and some really good information on our blog and uh, also some white papers that we can share. Um, so I'd be happy to, 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 to answer any questions anybody has. And I sure appreciate you reaching out, Mike. Uh, Hopefully, my next trip, we'll get to see one another. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's always great to catch up, Andy. And and uh, thanks, thanks for coming on again. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Andy, for coming on and sharing with us all. I hope we have the chance to catch up with him in his next trip to Shenzhen. And thanks for listening, everybody. And let's keep on learning and keeping our minds open for different types of international business. Don't forget, uh, I've got my funny or test new video podcast coming out next week, challenging myself again. And I hope you enjoy. I'm sharing openly a lot of knowledge and uh, the links it's not yet online. So, you know, the best way to keep up to date with these new things coming out is my global from Asia newsletter. It's at global from Asia.com slash subscribe. And thank everybody and have a great day. Bye bye. To get more info about running an international business via Hong Kong, please visit our website at www.globalfromasia.com. That's www.globalfromasia.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes feed. Thanks for tuning in.